Executive Director of the Václav Havel Library Foundation, and uh, and uh, uh, I feel really privileged to that uh, uh, to be introducing such a wonderful panel. Uh, I would like to thank Kevin Parts and everyone at the New York Public Library for Performing Arts for hosting this special talk. I would like to thank our partner, the Consulate General of the Czech Republic in New York. I'd like to welcome the Consul uh, General Arnoš Karoš. Also, uh, I'm very happy that I can uh, welcome the Chair of Havel Foundation, who flew from Chicago for this special event, former ambassador to the Czech Republic, Andy Shapiro. <laughs> this talk is a part of our series that we call Havel Conversations, in which international leaders, diplomats, scholars, writers, economists, and artists engage in the continuing debate over the most profound issues facing the global community freedom, human rights, the state of democracy, economic policies, and global citizenship. Um, the, and the Czech underground culture definitely played an important role in all, these, in all these topics, essential role during the 1970s and 80s, and it is my great pleasure to welcome two protagonists who were present during that time. Uh, Paul Wilson was born and educated in Canada and England, but his life took a dramatic turn when he went to Czechoslovakia in the summer of 1967 to teach English. A year after he arrived, Warsaw Pact troops invaded the country to crush the so-called Prague Spring. Uh, Paul stayed on, and in 1970 was invited to join the Plastic People of the Universe, a rock band founded after the invasion. Under the guidance of Ivan Yeros, the band regrouped and developed a repertoire consisting mostly of cover versions of the songs by two legendary New York bands, The Velvet Underground and The Fox. Wilson was expelled from Czechoslovakia in 1977 for his association with the band and went on to form a record company, Boží Ring, that put on and distributed music by the plastic people and other musicians of the Czech underground. Paul is also a very accomplished translator by uh, well-known Czech writers Josef Škvorecký, Ivan Klima, Bohumil Hrabal, and he also translated essays, speeches, and plays by Václav Havel. Ivan Bithansl is a musician and producer. At the turn of the 1930s and 80s, he played with Czech underground bands such as DG307 and the Plastic People of the Universe. After the Velvet Revolution in 1989, he continued in his musical career, but he also started to produce music. So far, he has recorded and released over 60 music albums, including several DVDs. He accompanied Allen Ginsberg and Ed Sanders on bass during one of their last visits to Prague. With the renewed Plastic People of the Universe lineup, he performed at Joe's Pub and Knitting Factory, However, his name is mainly associated with the Avon Orchestra, an ensemble for contemporary music with which he has performed at a number of international festivals, including Bang on a Can at Lincoln Center and Next Wave at Ben. As the owner of the Analog Remaster Instant Studio, he has an extensive audio and video archive documenting the Czech underground music movement before 1989. And we are really uh, happy to be joined by a special guest, uh, Sylvia Reed, the second of three wives of the late recording artist, songwriter, and musician Lou Reed. She was integral to his life and work during the many years they spent together. Sylvia became the manager of Lou's career, as well as collaborating with him in many aspects of the creative work during these years. Some key areas were album cover design, set design and lighting design for performances and films during what was arguably the most prolific period of Lou Reed's art and life. Sylvia's impact including album cover design for several albums including The Blue Mask, songs for Drella, the album Lou Reed and John Cale created as a tribute to Andy Warhol 
resulted in a Grammy nomination for the album of Borg, co-designed by Sylvia. Sylvia was, was with Lou Reed during his first trip to Prague and was in the room during his notable interview with Václav Havel. Sylvia lives in New York and is currently working on a book about her life with Lou. And uh, so that's, that's all, all my introductions and I'd like to come in now to say all the technical stuff that I'm not familiar with. Uh, I'd like to tell you that there will be Q&A, that this uh, session is being recorded and uh, I hope that you will enjoy the night. Thank you. It's, uh, uh, it's really great to see uh, a crowd like this, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're here because you're all interested in, in the topic. Um, I, I don't know, um, we can maybe switch. Um, the Plastic People, as you heard in the introduction, the Plastic People, as you heard in the introduction, uh, started up in 1968 after the Soviet invasion. And uh, at, at the time, uh, they had already, all of the members of the band had already played in other bands. But this was a special uh, uh, occasion because um, they, uh, you know, as Leonard Cohen says, there's, there's always there's a crack in, the, in everything. And that's how the light gets through. And the particular crack that, uh, that the plastic people exploited was uh, the arrival of, I don't know how it got there, but uh, the arrival of a record by the Velvet Underground. And uh, there's an old joke about the Velvet Underground and Sylvia, I'm sure you know, uh, this joke about uh, they, were, they published the first, the first issue was 2,000 records and it spawned 2,000 bands. Um, and the Plastic People were one of them. Um, and and uh, so they, uh, they, they started off uh, and there, there was another sort of confluence here because there was, a, there was a, an art critic who was born in in a small town in Bohemia uh, called Ivan Eros. And uh, Ivan Eros began his, his adult career as an art critic, as an art historian. And his main interest was in medieval music. Um, and then uh, one summer, I think it was the summer probably of 64, 65, another crack in the wall, uh, and uh, The Hard Day's Night got through, and uh, he saw The Hard Day's Night with his wife and uh, said, you know, his life was changed by rock and roll, to quote. <laughs> to agree. Um, and, and so he began to think that, that, uh, that, that rock and roll was, was something, uh, something revolutionary and something that, that, the, uh, that, uh, that was more, more revolutionary, in, in fact, than, than the kind of ideas that were coming across in, in written texts. And uh, so he decided to ally himself with, uh, with this burgeoning rock scene in, in Prague. And in 68, there were, there were literally hundreds of rock bands uh, that had, had sprung up in the atmosphere of the new freedom. And one of them was uh, a band called the Primitives Group, uh, which uh, sort of had a, a, a flash in the pan career. And uh, then the Plastic People arrived, and Euros was attracted to them and sort of attached himself to, to the band and became their artistic director. Um, they, they had a business manager at that point, uh, and Euros' function was to kind of help them do stagecraft. And, and, uh, and the, the business manager eventually fell off. There was a, the, 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 uh, uh, he had a plan to, to take the band abroad so they could make a lot of money, uh, and Euros was opposed to this, and, and several other members of the band were. And so the, the band shrunk down to a kind of a hardcore. And at that point, uh, this is what the time that I, I met Euros by accident, and uh, he asked me to join the band. I think the reason why he asked me to join the band was because they needed someone to listen to the Velvet Underground records and transcribe the lyrics. <laughs> uh, and uh, some of it was fairly straightforward, and some of it was very difficult. Um, the, uh, I was talking to Sylvia earlier this evening about how uh, he actually, uh, there, there, were, there were some lines that, that, uh, that were, sounded to me like gobbledygook. Uh, and I, I now have them in, in print, and I, I can see that they were, they were like personal names, like, you know, uh, some kind of love, and then there's another line uh, that, that uh, anyway. Uh, so, 
Uh, I transcribed these songs and, and uh, coached the, band, the rest of the band on their on their uh, their pronunciation. And we we played um, as an amateur band at this point. Uh, and I'm going to just actually flip through some of these things here. This is a band uh, just before I joined. Um, and I, I don't know whose idea it was to dress them up in, in, uh, in costumes like this, in sort of androgynous costumes. I don't think they're making any particular point. Um, just that there were, you know, there's, there's a sort of fluid identity going on with, with the band. Um, and uh, this was, uh, when I first saw the band in 1969, this is what they looked like. They had long gowns, uh, and the, the, um, the, at the bottom of each gown, there's a, there's a, a, a letter that spells out UFO, I think. Um, anyway, and they had a stage, a stage show that involved a fire eater and lots of, lots of uh, fire in ashtrays, and, and it, was a, it kind of made up for their, their lack of skill, as, as I was going to uh, And so, anyway, this is uh, just about the same time. This is what the uh, Velvet Underground looked like. Um, I mean, they weren't much older than, than not, maybe they were the same age as, as the, the plastic people. But this was, I think, from 1966. And this was the album that uh, actually inspired uh, the plastics to form a band, or rather to add to their repertoire. Uh, this is, uh, these are, uh, this is Fugs in uh, probably 1965, 1966, Tully Comfortberg. Ed Sanders on, on the left, and I don't know who the other person is. Maybe somebody in the audience does. Uh, okay, and and uh, they were, I would say, not as influential in in the band actually forming itself. But they were they were certainly added to their repertoire. The the folks um, were were uh, making songs, protest songs, usually inspired by the kind of the strange atmosphere around the Vietnam War. And uh, oddly enough. The, uh, the atmosphere of these songs and the, and the language of, of the songs uh, fitted in quite nicely with the situation after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. Uh, one of their songs was, when the mode of the music changes, the walls of the city shake. And it's a, a kind of a, a, a quotation from Plato. Um, and it actually turned out to be quite true um, of, the, of the plastic people in that whole musical scene. Uh, and, oops. And uh, this is one of the records that we li listened to quite in intently. Uh, it's entitled, It Crawled Into My Hand, Honest. <laughs> you can take that to mean what you want. Um, and uh, another song that they, that they sang and that we sang uh, was Dover Beach. It was a, a, a based on a poem by, by Matthew Arnold, 19th century poem. Uh, and one of the, the refrains of the, of the poem is, is kind of like, uh, it be, became a kind of a theme for, for Euros and other people of the underground. Let us be true to one another, let us be true to one another, let us be true, let us be true, let us be true to one another. And that really is the kind of essence of the, of the, the ethos and the atmosphere in the, in the Prague underground from the Revolution of last two people. Uh, so, I think... Yvonne, I'll pass it to you to talk about um, the next phase of the band's development and the other yeah, So, So, Paul was in Prague as a teacher of English in some like school, and um, by chance, by accident, he was a singer of Plastic Pitro. And, uh, and, and the repertoire of that time was 90% was from Velvet on the ground. And I would like to ask Nick to, to play first video. Tato kapela, jak možná nevíte všichni, ale ví jistě část publika, hraje občas a není ráda viděna jistými orgány kdekoliv. Čili budete-li dělat bordel, uskodíte tím jak sobě, protože nedostanete pivo a při kofole vás to přestane bavit jako i nás, protože při kofole se tato hudba provozovat nedá. Bude-li pivo, Budete spokojení vy, my také a doufám, že se rozejdete po skončení produkce v naprostém klidu domů. My tady hrajeme prvně, ale jsou tady zprávy o tom, že po minulých bytových představeních tady byly různé takzvané průvodní zjevy. Byl bych rád, kdybyste si všichni uvědomili, že 
Není důležité rozmlátit cestou autobus nebo poškodit vesnici, pobouřit obyvatele. Buď chcete poslouchat tuto hudbu v prostředí, které se nám všem líbí, s nápoji, které máme všichni rádi, a nebo ji nebudete poslouchat vůbec. To záleží pouze na vás. To je vše, co jsem vám chtěl říci. V případě, že tomu budete rozumět, tak vám děkuji. Předávám slovo jednomu z pořadatelů. Jménem pořadatelů sděluji, že další sud je již naražen.
who wish to rid themselves of the skepticism which says that nothing can be done and shows them that much can be done when those who make the culture desire little for themselves and much for others. <clears throat> he wrote that in 1975. And uh, in that essay, there's a phrase that Havel picked up on called, uh, and he said, that what we really want in the underground is just the, the, the possibility of living in truth. And Havel took that, that slogan and, and turned it into a, into a major essay called uh, The Power of Powerless, which uh, had a tremendous impact all throughout East, Eastern Europe. I should just say one more thing. Um, this is Euros. I want, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. There's a very important moment in, in uh, 1975 when the underground, which was a, you know, a kind of a, a bunch of young people doing what they wanted to do, and the Czech intellectual descent came together. And that happened when, when Euros met with Havel. It was a, it was a very, uh, it was a clandestinely arranged meeting. However, in the meantime, uh, two weeks later, uh, the, the police made a raid on, on multiple, pardon the expression, multiple uh, places, and, and they arrested 19 of the, of the people in the un underground and, and did, uh, conducted all kinds of home uh, searches. And it turned out afterwards, we discovered after 1989, that the person who had opened the bar for them, made them, you know, gave, gave them the opportunity to meet, was also working for the secret police. <laughs> so uh, that was the, uh, the beginning of, of, the, of the really sort of hardcore existence when, uh, when the underground was, was under, under a great deal of, of pressure. However, Havel and his, his mates, especially Havel, uh, went to the trial of, of, of the, there were, there were trials of, of uh, I think, seven in Prague and, and four in Pilsen. And he went to the trial and wrote an essay about it called The Trial. Uh, I think the reference to Kafka was deliberate. And he uh, uh, came to the conclusion that these young people were putting their existences on the line, whereas the intellectuals were simply they were writing letters to Heinrich Bull and, and, and Jean-Paul Sartre, and uh, they, were, they were not really kind of risking enough, and it was time to take a bigger risk. And out of that, out of that realization, and of that union of the underground and the intellectual descent, came Charter Seventy Seven, which was the uh, sort of human rights manifesto that dominated Czech politics for the next ten years, and uh, and which eventually uh, in, encouraged and, and you know helped to to create the the situation in which you know the the regime collapsed basically. So. Yes, please. Hi, I just wanted to take this one moment because we're getting, a, we're being given a lot of information. It's probably new to a lot of us. Um, during my time, uh, we're interacting with this subject matter because we had been invited to interview, uh, Lou had been invited to interview Pablo at the time when the, the changeover was very unique. I, I want to promote this book to you because this book helped me understand, I believe it's the only uh, chronology of what happened. So if you have, because I was conscious of certain threads of this happening, but this really helps you put it in a time and place. Um, and I believe the author is here tonight. Uh, I, what I recommend it highly. Uh, I think you can turn you to his website or you can order it if you wish to. It's the consumer guide to the classic people of the universe. <laughs> video was the last public concert, so it was Czech Arab it was 1974, I think. Yes. Shall we skip it or, or we can play it? Was that the last public concert? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Okay, so Nick, please play the video number two. For long hair, I've been at the concert of the Plastic People of the Universe. People of the Universe která se vám představí v nové sestavě. Ještě než představím sestavu, tak bych vám měl rád jednu poznámku. Možná, že si uvědomujete, že veškeré peníze, které vydělá kapela, tak dáváme do zesilovačů, aparatury a všeho, co je potřeba, aby kapela vůbec mohla hrát. Čili 
jestliže někdo z vás považuje v této souvislosti za prestižní otázku dostatek sem bez placení, máme, pro což máme všichni pochopení, protože sami jsme taky nikdy nikde neplatili, tak to znamená, že čím méně se zaplatí, tím méně bude kapela si moc pořídit dalších věcí, aby se hrálo ještě jinde. To je jenom na okraj. Čili se zamyslete nad tím, co máte radši, jestli kapelu nebo pustit tu pětku, za kterou je pouze pět piv. A nyní vám představím kapelu v novém složení. Především je to Paul Robert Wilson, harmonika, kazu, finger bells, tom. Dále Jiří Přemysl Števy, Guitar Electric Fantastic, wow, wow. Jan Jílek, Trumpet, wow, wow. Eman Buben. Mejla Bacho Kombináto. Jiří Kabeš, pagany českého bítu, Electric Violin. Pipko, Electric Piano, Guitar, Booster. Kvašňák, Sumec Atomik. Provedu svatbu a nec
his meeting with Havel, uh, which probably would never have happened if somehow Havel got this label that he was the rock and roll president because of his support for the plastic people. And it kind of stuck. And uh, although Havel could barely carry a tune himself, um, you know, he, he had this label attached to it that, uh, that, 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 uh, that brought him to loop and, and also Frank Zappa and other <coughs> Dylan, I think, showed up. And, and uh, there were a lot of people who came to Prague uh, after the Red Velvet Revolution to talk to Lou Reed and to talk to Hollow Brother. I, I think it was because there is. Can you put the mic closer? Thank you. Can you hear me now? I think it was because the. Um, Momentum was building up because the entire world was taken with this story, and that the idea of the soundtrack of the revolution became, uh, you know, part of the consciousness of people. It it, it had come to to Lou and I a little piece one year earlier. Uh, we had come to meet a Russian uh, musician named Boris Grebenshikov. And there had been a similar type of story where he had told us, I think, I can't remember which label had brought him over, but he used to be referred to as the Bob Dylan of Russia. And Lou and he got along when we met very, very nicely. He even came to visit us in our, in our home. And uh, he told the story that, uh, similar to what was happening in, in Prague, that you couldn't just go to a record store and buy a record. And you know, it was exci something exciting for us to hear about was that person to person to person, you know, a hand to hand with these uh, tapes that you would record and you know, record your own copy and pass it on, et cetera, et cetera. That that was the way that music became disseminated. And it was so interesting because the intensity of you know, the, the, the need for music the reaching out for having some piece of what we call freedom in your taste and the culture, what you're, what you're able to listen to, what you're, uh, the idea that you could be stopped from listening. This was very exciting, and that sort of come into our consciousness a year before, and then this all happened. Uh, at the time, we were in Europe having uh, the same week, I believe it was, the, during this particular period, 1990, Lou was working extremely hard. We were constantly on the road. And we happened to place this visit to Prague in between meeting, uh, going to the, the large concert celebration of Nelson Mandela, which I think they, they, some of the audience remember, and another concert which was in, held in Liverpool as the first John Lennon tribute. And so we made a stopover between those two events to go to Prague. We'd been invited, uh, ostensibly to, for Lou to behave as a professional journalist of the time, to, for Rolling Stone magazine, so that Rolling Stone would be like, you're right at the cutting edge here, and they, and they bring Lou in to, to do that interview. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't see eye to eye on the content or something about the tone of the interview. I think maybe they expected something a little different from Lou. But we were swept up in a uh, being there in this unusual place at this moment when I think he, uh, Pavel had only been uh, president for maybe two or three months before we showed up. So that there was still a lot of the old culture there. Uh, I remember that it, it, it felt very tentative. You know, we. No one was acting as if we knew, like, oh, you know, now revolution has come and everything's going to be, you know, just fabulous from here on out. There was a sense of uh, some ominousness in some circumstances, as if maybe this won't last. It, it reminds me now of the relevance of what, you know, uh, independence, freedom, and democracy, you know, could stand for. These, that these moments are tenuous and that we should value them. So we showed up uh, in Prague, very beautiful city, and I remember entering the palace. Havel was very, he was like uh, so conscious of his role and his need to do this properly. So he's very um, 
sort of professional and you know, trying very hard to be very, you know, presidents at Lou, who's, you know, we're, he and I are caught in sort of the emotional moment. So Lou's kind of being uh, a little looser and uh, bringing, uh, you know, a sort of charm to it. That's what, when I read the interview, oh, let me show you the book. This interview is, is hard to, uh, for anyone to access, so I want you to know it's in this book, which is a book between thought and expression, the lyrics of Lou Reed, and we included, we ended up including the interview and another interview he'd done with Hubert Selby in the back of this book. Uh, you need to know that because the interview itself, as I said, Rolling Stone didn't publish it. I believe there was one other magazine which did publish it, but it's, it's hard to find, so you'll find it in there. Um, I believe for Lou, it was uh, sort of an emotional thrill because I think we were it was still finally sinking in about an importance of the music in a way <coughs> where it changed everything. Everything was different after that moment. So it was more, uh, like I said, an emotional moment for us. And Hava was extremely busy, and so he's sort of trying to, like, you know, they're, they're having a wonderful meeting, but he's trying to push it along. He's got a lot of, you know, very important ministers of this and that to me. And he also, his real goal was obvious. He wanted to hear the play. <laughs> <laughs> and in the context of whether Lou had ever realized, because of course we knew that the, uh, the, pre the momentum behind his being in the city and that other artists were there, and we knew a little bit about plastic people and full knots, and I sort of understood that this, there was going to be this pressure. But Lou was sort of trying not to, he didn't really want to acknowledge that or think of that. He didn't want to believe as if, you know, uh, that he sort of had to watch out for that. Uh, he, he wanted it to be more of a, a, a personal meeting, not, not something where he was going to have to, you know, get up and prove himself, I guess it is. Because when the interview was completed and Havel had very smoothly, he's a wonderful negotiator, very smoothly convinced Lou not to worry that going to this club and appearing in front of these people was going to be just wonderful and he would have a wonderful time. And so he, could he play with the video? Yes, no? this is a good chance to play a little bit of the... So he could please play. play video number four. We need a busload of things to get by. 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 Goodly heart and goodly heart to give you lampshades and so you can't depend on no sacrament, no father, no holy ghost. But you can depend on cruelty and crudity of thought and of sound. You can depend on the worst always having a baby. Need a busload of faith to get by. Busload of faith to get by. You can't depend on no miracle. You can't depend on the air. You can't depend on any wise men. You know why you can't find them? Because they're not there. All that you can depend on cruelty and crudity and thought and of sound. You can depend on the worst of it happening. You need a busload of faith to get by. Busload of faith to get by. 
Pas slow of feet to get by. Pas slow of feet to get by. Pas slow of feet to get by. They say he didn't have an enemy. His was a greatness to behold. It was the last surviving progeny. The last one on this side of the world. Measure half a mile from tip to tail. Silver and black with powerful fins. They say he could break a mountain or two. That's how we got the Grand Canyon. Let's go hit American way up. 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 Off the Carolinas, the lighthouse goes mostly in the day. The light shows mostly there at night. The chief of a local tribe had killed the racist May's son. Been on death row since 1958. Other the May's kid was a rowdy pig. Spit on Indians and lots worse. The old chief took, put a hatchet in his head. Life compared to death made him seem worse. The tribal brothers gathered in a lighthouse to sing. Try to conjure up a little storm or some rain. The harbor part of the way and the great whale sprang straight up, causing a huge tidal wave. The wave crushed the jail and freed the chief. The tribe let out a roar. Lights were drowned, the browns and reds set free. Sadly, one thing more. Some idiot member of a gun club kept a bazooka in his living room. And thinking he had the old chief in his sights, blew the great whale's brains out with a lead harpoon. That's great American whale. That's great American whale. Great American whale. Last great American whale. Americans don't care too much for anything. Land and water are the least. And animal life is low on the totem pole. Human life's not worth much more than infected yeast. Americans don't care too much for beauty. They'll shit in a river. Dump battery acid in the stream. The watch dead. The rats wash up on their beaches covered with oil. Then they'll complain they can't swim. They say that things have been done for the majority. Don't believe half of what you see, none of what you hear. It's like what, what my pen friend Donald said to me. Stick a fork in their ass, turn them over, they're done.
had a lot of trepidation right up to the moment uh, because of the sense of expectation in the room. It was thick, you know, because people were, you know, this was a, an incredibly iconic figure to them that had so much import. So the, the pressure was on him, and he was very hesitant right up till the last second. And I will tell you, this is the only time in all our years together I literally put my hands on his back. You gotta get out there. The moment is here. There's no going back. He's like, Don't push me. And went out, and of course they, they were amazing. So it was a very exciting moment, and, and it was one of the special things I remember is uh, the look on Hoffman's face uh, was just being me, and it, it was a, it was a, a very emotional moment and. That's the little thought, I think, of friendship that was to last for years. Okay. Sure. Shall we play 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 Shall
if you want to talk a little bit about uh, how the music got out. Um, the, uh, when I was expelled, um, I formed a record company with a, with a Czech in exile living in London called Elon Hartel. <laughs> Goes to the machine, um, and and um, we uh, uh, we started putting out uh, records of, his, of, of, the, of the plastic people, and um, the the first record we put out um, was called Egon Bondi's Happy Hearts Club Band. Um, <laughs> band being uh, the operative word there, and uh, this, I won't trouble you with the saga of how that happened. It was a, it was a, a very long and, and painful process. Um, because uh, Ivan and myself had uh, differing views about how the music should be presented. He wanted to present it in a, in a political context, and I wanted it to be uh, non-political. I wanted the music to be able to stand on its own. Um, and uh, we compromised, and uh, this record came out. Then I moved to Canada and, uh, and started putting out records on, on my own without, without the political sort of context. And one of the first records we put out was uh, a, an Easter uh, passion play that the Plastic People had done. I think he played on it as well. Um, and uh, it was a remarkable piece of, of uh, oratorio and rock and uh, recitative. And uh, a, a friend of mine who was a, um, a radio producer uh, and a, a composer of his own, he, he composed uh, classical music heard it and uh, decided to put it on, on the radio and uh, he put it on, on national radio at Easter and uh, the money that we got from that, from selling that, uh, was, I was able to uh, press the record and distribute it and it was the Bojimin's best seller uh, and uh, it was distributed I think here in, in, in New York, uh, there was a company, uh, a, a small collective uh, uh, based on, in uh, Lower Broadway, uh, the, the distributed jazz and uh, avant-garde music, and uh, they took it on and sold several hundred copies. And I think I think we we all all together sold maybe several thousand copies of it, which is pretty good for a really you know basic indie record company. And um, that kind of put the put the plastic people on, on the map in the, in the, the broader context. Uh, and uh, so you know it's all these things are just confluences of of influences, and uh, so that was how that happened. Uh, so we can play with the yeah. number three now, uh, which is private concert at Russell Bowers Farm. Yeah. 
Tomáši Ondřej, nespěte, jen hodinu jděte se mnou. Počkejte, teď je ten čas ta hodina. Šimone, Jakube, Tomáš. Otče, odej mi tady hodnosti ode mne. Ale ne, jak já chci, ale jak ty chceš. Nevydrželi nic ani hodinu. Yeah. 
Hodej mi tady hustosti u mne. 